My name is Sonia Hilgren. I am president of the Press Club and editor of Farm Journal. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN, listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. Tomorrow, Rene Preval, the president of Haiti, will present a speech entitled Haiti, Democracy and Investment. On Wednesday, March 27th, Tom Downs, the president and chairman of the board of Amtrak, will talk about the future of Amtrak, focusing on high-speed rail on the eastern seaboard and rail safety. And on Thursday, April 4th, economist Lester Thoreau will address a press club audience. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have any questions for our speakers, please write them on the cards at your table, send them up to me, and I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Nancy Shia, Federal News Service. Robert Vitale, Thompson Newspapers. Annette Lucitra, Executive Editor, Education Daily. Keith White, Gannett News Service. Frank Okafer, Washington Bureau Chief, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and past president of the National Press Club. I'm going to skip over one of our speakers for a moment. Peggy Roberson, freelance journalist and chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. And then I'll skip over our other speaker. Tommy Batt, Las Vegas, I'm sorry, Tony Batt, Las Vegas Review Journal. Kevin Keene, communications director for Governor Thompson. William Salisbury, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Peter West, Education Week. And Lewis Perlman, executive editor, Knowledge, Inc. In 1989, at the request of then President George Bush, the nation's governors gathered at the first National Education Summit. They set six goals, later expanded to eight, for improving public, elementary, and secondary education. Almost seven years later, another summit is planned next week, March 26th and 27th. The National Governors Association says that at most, only modest progress has been made in achieving the 1989 goals, and in some areas, students' performance has actually declined. A recent Gallup poll found that education, for the first time, was the number one issue of concern for Americans ahead of crime, health care, welfare, and jobs. Here today to discuss the upcoming Education Summit are this year's chairman of the National Governors Association, Republican Governor Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin, and the vice president of the NGA, Democratic Governor Bob Miller of Nevada. Our first speaker today, Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson, is perhaps best known for his campaign to reform Wisconsin's welfare system. Governor Thompson has also stressed education. He has advocated, for example, statewide examinations that would allow comparisons among schools and school districts, special aid to schools that are particularly effective in educating their students, and school choice, state subsidies to help parents pay tuition for their children at private schools. Before becoming governor, Tommy Thompson spent 20 years in the Wisconsin State Assembly, the last five as leader of, for the GOP minority. He earned the nickname Dr. No for his efforts to contain state spending. Our second speaker today, Democratic Governor Bob Miller of Nevada, has also pushed education reform since he was first elected governor in 1990. Governor Miller has stressed the need to improve the quality of education, even as the state struggled to provide enough classrooms as Nevada's population grew exponentially in recent years. He has pushed for smaller elementary school classes and the use of educational technology. Before being elected governor, Governor Miller was first lieutenant governor and then later served as acting governor for two years after Governor Richard Bryan was elected to the U.S. Senate. Governor Miller has been active in efforts to aid victims of crimes, an interest growing out of his earlier career as a deputy sheriff, deputy district attorney, and then two-term district attorney in Las Vegas, a sensitive position in that mecca for gamblers. 
He has served as president of the National District Attorneys Association and was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to the National Task Force on Victims Assistance. We look forward to what our speakers have to tell us today about the upcoming National Education Summit. First, give a National Press Club welcome to Governor Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you for inviting myself and uh, Governor, Governor Bob Miller from Nevada to meet with you here today and to discuss uh, what I think is probably the most important subject facing America today. We're going to be discussing education at the Education Summit next week, and I believe it's going to serve as two watershed days for the future of education in our respective states. This summer, our athletes will once again compete against the world's best in the Centennial Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. Imagine for a moment what our country's reaction would be if America and its athletes finished 14th in the medal count in Atlanta. There would be banner headlines in every one of your newspapers, every reporter and columnist in this room, and across this country would be asking, what's wrong with America? But right now, we rank that low in the world when it comes to education. Our students rank 14th compared to other nations in math and 13th in science. Yet nobody really seems to be overly concerned. This isn't front page news. The pundits aren't writing about it to any significant extent. And no one is questioning whether America is losing its edge on the rest of the world. To me, that's wrong. It's time for America to get its priorities straight and put the education of our children ahead of athletics. If we don't, America will lose its position as the world leader. Other nations will pass us by. And we will lose our competitive standing in the global marketplace. Next Tuesday and Wednesday, the nation's governors and 50 business CEOs all across America will convene the 1996 Education Summit in Palisades, New York. We will do so with the goal of refocusing the nation's attention on education and the need to do better by our children. I will be co-hosting this summit as chairman of the National Governors Association with IBM Chairman Lou Gerstner and Governor Bob Miller, the Vice Chairman of NGA. The idea for the Education Summit came to me last July when we were convened up in Vermont. Lou Gerstner had given a stirring speech challenging governors to do more in the area of standards. And I agreed we needed to be more aggressive in the area. So after I took over as chairman of the NGA and ECF, I called Lou and asked him to join me in hosting a national education summit that would focus solely on helping states set academic standards in core subject areas, as well as developing the means to assess how well we meet those standards. We agreed that standards must be the foundation for any efforts to raise the quality of education in our country. Standards drive excellence, whether it be in athletics, business, or education. In the Olympics, our athletes know the standards that they must meet to achieve excellence. They know how fast they have to run if they expect to win a gold medal. They know how far they have to heave a shot putt if they even want to make our Olympic team. And they know that if they want to set an Olympic record for the high jump, they must clear a bar set higher than seven feet, nine and a half inches. Olympic athletes have standards by which to measure themselves and their competitors. The bar of excellence keeps rising for these athletes as the standards keep getting higher. This forces the athlete to become better, stronger, and more competitive. Our schools, however, don't have such standards nor do they have effective means of assessing how well they meet those standards. Therefore, our students and parents have nothing by which, or governors, to accurately measure the success of our excellence or our mediocrity in education. This helps explain why every year in schools across America, we have students graduating from high school, haven't supposedly met the standards necessary to receive a high school diploma, yet they can't read, they can't write. They can't do basic math. Thus is the reason, the focus of the Education Summit. It will be to encourage each and every state 
across America to set education standards for their schools. We hope to leave the summit with all governors, and there will be 45 participating, signing an agreement to return to their states and set standards and assessments within two years. Now let me make something absolutely clear, absolutely clear about what we mean about standards. We're not talking about outcome-based education or some politically correct cultural standards such as measuring some child's cognitive diversity conflict management skills. We are talking about solid, purely academic standards in core subject areas. And discussion at the summit will be strictly limited to core subject areas such as reading, writing, math, geography, and basic science. If you can't read and write, if you can't calculate, if you don't know the difference between Wisconsin and Arkansas, <laughs> you should not be able to get a diploma, period. And if a school district is failing to teach those skills, the parents and taxpayers to deserve to know about it. It's called accountability, and it is what our schools are greatly lacking right now. Standards and assessments provide accountability. The summit we will stress that these standards must be set at the state and local level, with parents, teachers, school boards, administrators, business, taxpayers, and state leaders all working together as partners. The standards will not be set at the summit. That task will be left solely up to each individual state. In Wisconsin, for example, we are currently developing a process for setting local graduation standards that will be developed by each of our communities. I have proposed that by the year 2000, every student in Wisconsin must pass a graduation test in order to receive his or her diploma. In every interview I have done on the summit, I have been asked if the education summit is just another extension of Goals 2000 in the Charlottesville summit. I want to tell you, absolutely not. The 1996 education summit is truly the diametric opposite of Goals 2000. Goals 2000, I participated, as did Bob Miller, was a noble effort. But it was not embraced by the American public. Because why? It was a top-down initiative that came from Washington. The Education Summit takes a ground-up approach that emphasizes strong local control over the setting of the standards. There is a marked difference in approaches between the two summits. And I believe it will mean the difference between success and failure in our attempts to set education standards for our children and improve the quality of education across our country. Education reform will only be successful if it is done from the ground up. It must evolve from our neighborhoods and our communities. Any attempt to set standards at the federal level through a top-down approach, I believe, is doomed to fail. Make no mistake about it. Education is a local issue. And as we pursue standards, an important partner will be the business community. Businesses of all sizes, from the Ma and Pa corner store to the large corporation of America. They must be proactive in helping communities and school districts set the standards. Businesses must work closely with parents, with school boards, with teachers and community leaders in setting the standards. Businesses must let schools and communities know what they expect of students when they graduate. They need to let schools know what skills students need in order to succeed in the workplace. And if students are not graduating with the necessary skills, businesses need to work with our schools to find the solution. I am very encouraged by the businesses community's response. Everybody is calling either Bob or myself asking if they can come to the summit, which is a strong indication that there's a desire to help. Lou Gerstner at IBM deserves tremendous credit for leading the way on this issue with the business community. In closing, I would just like to refer back to my speech before this club about a year ago. I was here to, spot, to talk to you about welfare and the devolution of government. But I used the last five minutes of my speech to suggest that education reform become the next welfare reform issue in America, the next hot issue that this country would really focus on. Fortunately, that day has come. Everyone involved in this summit was encouraged by a recent national poll 
that show that education now has become the number one issue among Americans. We have a golden opportunity to re-energize America about education and reinvigorate our schools. The Education Summit will help us seize the opportunity so we can be better do our job for our children. It's time we made a high school diploma a ticket to opportunity instead of just a keepsake. I would ask you rhetorically, would you please raise your hand when you applied for a job did anybody ever ask to see your high school diploma or ask how you did in high school and what credits you took and what grades you got? Did anybody? Isn't that sad? I've given that same question to audiences all over America and only three people across America have ever been asked for their high school diploma and what grades they took in high school or how, how well they did in high school. Let's make sure our students learn the skills they need to succeed in the workplace. It's time we performed as well in the classrooms as we do on the Olympic playing fields. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you so very much for allowing the NGA to be a, a participant at your luncheon meeting. And now I would like to turn it over to my friend and partner, Governor Bob Miller from Nevada. Thanks, Tommy. I'm here to, today to tell you why I believe that next week's National Education Summit could well mark a positive turning point for American education. Now, I'm not surprised if many of you are rolling your eyes with skepticism because educational reform is a perennial topic, and it probably dates back to the first time that a school marm put chalk to the board in the first one-room schoolhouse. Everybody's got an opinion on how to better educate our kids, and many think that they have the magic solution. In the 50s, a bestseller was entitled, Why Johnny Can't Read. A little later, the space race drove American educators to try and transform each child into a miniature Werner von Braun. By the late 60s and into the 70s, we were tossing out traditional academic rigor and replacing it with an overarching concern with student self-esteem. Any vestige of competition or student ranking was cleansed from most of our schools, and so it went. By some time in the 1980s, we woke up to the fact that decades of reform had culminated in a declining student achievement. Cold, hard test scores showed something was going awry. Far be it for me to lay any blame at the feet of those who had tried to change and improve the American education. I'm sure that many of the voguish educational theories of recent decades have had some merit. No doubt reformers have had the best interests of children at heart. And Lord knows our teachers and students have faced fearsome societal forces, forces that have forever altered what it means to be a child in our society, or a teacher, or a parent. Violence, drugs, shattered families. But again, by the mid-1980s, it was clear that American students were falling farther and farther behind their counterparts in other industrialized nations. Now against that historical backdrop, I can see why I might face some sales resistance as I pitch the National Education Summit. Many could rightly ask, isn't this summit just another warm and fuzzy interlude to make us feel like we're doing something about educational problems? Isn't it just another conference? another seminar, another symposium, like so many that have claimed to have the educational magical wand. My answer to that question is simply no. No, the summit is not just another meeting. No, it's not just a placebo to make us think we're accomplishing something. I say that because I believe states and local school districts have been gradually heading in the right direction for several years now. No question we bottomed out in the 1980s. But test scores have been inching up steadily ever since. The biggest gains are often found in areas of a high proportion of at-risk students. And I can tell you that I'm a frequent visitor to classrooms in Nevada. I see many, many problem areas. 
But I also see crystal clear areas of progress. I see what can be accomplished through involvement of a whole community, and especially the business sector, backed up by strong state support. I'm no Pollyanna on this subject. But I reject the all too popular, even trendy pessimism that often dominates educational dialogue. Yes, the nation faces difficult and frustrating states of educational affairs, but there is no cause for a defeatist attitude. One reason that I'm so high on the summit is it includes no room for defeatism or finding a fault. Another reason I have confidence is, as was indicated, uh, I'm a veteran of an earlier summit. In 1989, President Bush responded to the alarm bells about education and convened the nation governors at Charlottesville, Virginia. And out of that summit came a blueprint for educational rehabilitation called Goals 2000, a term that has gained a certain notoriety. Goals 2000 launched a grassroots effort to upgrade American schools, and it also committed critical federal dollars to fund instructional programs. Goals 2000 should be credited for measurable improvements in student achievements in recent years. And it should not be forgotten that the 1989 summit proved that a nationwide commitment to better education can be achieved. But, as I said a moment ago, I've been in the educational trenches too long to be a Pollyanna. Goals 2000 has been beneficial, but the pace of educational reform is moving too slowly. Our vision needs to be broadened, our goals lifted, and our commitment renewed. The National Education Summit is the place and the time for this broadening, this lifting, and this renewal. When we envision high quality education, we cannot be thinking only of the third grader in Omaha or the high schooler in Chicago or the middle school youngster in Los Angeles. We must also keep close eyes on the eighth grader in Tokyo the high school student at Paris, and the elementary pupil in Berlin. Because, and this is no hollow cliche, we are intertwined in a world economy. Our students in Omaha, Chicago, and Los Angeles are this minute locked in competition with their counterparts in Tokyo, Paris, and Berlin. And it would be an abdication of responsibility, our, our very birthright as Americans, if we should fail the next generation and not prepare them to prosper in an era of intense global economic competition. The first step in this quest is to raise the educational performance bar for all students. Governor Thompson speaks of America's pride in our athletic success in the Olympics. But imagine for a moment that all of these high jumpers had been training all these years to clear a three-foot bar instead of setting their aim at well over seven feet like the rest of the world. Or how about the Olympic dream team having played basketball all these years on an eight-foot basket suddenly to be immersed into an Olympic competition at 10 feet? I kind of like eight feet. I might be able to even dunk. But in any case, we wouldn't be the dream team if that's how we had trained. The same principle applies to our public school system. Our international academic com competitors have moved beyond minimum competencies and have set much higher goals. Kids in France, Germany, and Japan aren't smarter than American children. They simply have greater expectations placed upon them. We're in the bad habit of devaluing the potential and talent of our children. Too often we seem to be willing to accept underachieving standards suitable only for a Beavis, a, a Butthead, or a Bart Simpson. I can tell you that the nation's governors and CEOs are fed up with passive acceptance of mediocrity. Our upcoming summit seeks a commitment to higher, clearly defined, and measurable academic standards. The setting of standards, assessments, and accountability should be essentially a local responsibility. But no community or state exists in a vacuum. So we should also view and review standards in the context of an overall national improvement. We should encourage sharing of the best ideas from state to state. And we must also foster a productive competition to create the best schools. Let me say that the federal government has a strong role, even though it's limited to 7% of the total education funding. 
because those dollars are indispensable. They provide a cushion for school districts that can innovate, remediate, and reach higher standards. And I applaud the Clinton administration's efforts to give states more flexibility by waiving federal requirements that interfere with state and local education reform. I additionally commend them for making a commitment to helping our most vulnerable students uh, competitive through increased funding of programs like Title I. And again, going to bat for Goals 2000 funding, providing the means for local schools to carry out curriculum improvements. We need to maintain our partnership with the federal government, ensuring that each child has an access to a quality education. And once we determine what our kids need to know, we must be sure that our assessment tools are measuring the right information. We need to know what is broken, who isn't learning and why, who isn't safe, who's having trouble learning English, and which schools are underfunded. I believe that national multiple choice tests can provide some useful data, but they only give us part of the picture. Many of my home state Nevada school districts are working with business leaders to develop ways to measure workplace skills like punctuality, dependability, and professionalism. Clark County, for example, which is the 11th largest school district in the nation, has initiated a partnership with the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce aimed at helping students transition from school to career. During the high school years, each Nevada student develops a smart grad card, a resume that lists the student's achievements academically, community service, and rates his or her performance in workplace skills. And the business community is giving teeth to this program. Every member of the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce requests students to submit their smart grad card as part of the job interview process. Now all this effort on testing and measuring is not an end to itself, but a means to an end. One of our greatest challenges is to ensure that we are using the data gleaned from assessments wisely. In Nevada, for example, we've established a comprehensive school accountability law, which requires each school district to issue an annual report to parents in the community on individual school performance. The Reno Gazette Journal runs a full page on how each school compares to each other. And hopefully, through this process, we can identify the trouble spots in each district that can and should be improved with state and local support. Assessments, as I have come to understand, is a term of art in this reform debate. But we need to strip down this term to its roots. Kids take tests that are designed to let us know how they're doing academically. There's a whole science on this subject, but we laymen know a few important truths. The tests must measure important things, skills and knowledge. The tests must be fair, and fairness must not become a code for lowering standards. The tough question is what do we do about the children, teachers, administrators, and parents when schools do not achieve high test scores? Do we place sanctions against the schools, fire the teachers and administrators, or scold the parents? Do we give financial incentives to the schools that have demonstrated the most improvement during the year? This isn't about carrots and sticks, and it would be a tragic misdirection of effort if we embrace such so-called solutions. No parent that I've talked to wants his or her child to get a substandard education. And no one wants fairness to be used to falsely prove that a child is getting good grades. As all of you know, the truth is that parents want their kids to get a good education, and they want to be told the truth about their performance. It doesn't take a crystal ball to predict that the affluent suburban school districts will do markedly better on average compared to those districts that are poorer and burdened by many of our social problems. If we're committed to highlighting the performance discrepancies between schools and student to student and district three, we must be equally committed to providing the technical support and resources to our disadvantaged regions. This is the only way that we can ensure that all children will receive and reach their full potential. Education reform in the final analysis is not magic. It's going on in our schools, the length and breadth of this nation. And there's learning going on, and it's going well. And we have much to be proud of. But all too often, we know there are schools that are not measuring up, and we need to do better. Our quest to find out through standards and assessments what is and isn't working in our schools should not be twisted into some form of social triage. The test score should not verify, in some people's view, that some students will make it in our brave new high-tech world while others are expendable and can be left behind. 
I believe that the stakes are too high and too much is at risk for us not to promote academic excellence for every child. America is the only industrialized nation that is committed to giving every child a chance to perform at his or, high, his or her highest level. And we must build on that commitment. The National Education Summit will last uh, slightly more than 28 hours, a little bit longer than this speech. <laughs> but that is time enough for solidifying an alliance between governors and business leaders dedicated to raising educational standards. It's time enough to fully open our eyes to technological innovations that must be standard equipment in all classrooms. And I think my remarks have now taken time enough to conclude and open to questions and answers. Thank you very much. This is a question for both of you. Um, what is the political landscape in your states? Do you expect Clinton or Dole to win? Would Ross Perot affect the outcome in your states? Uh, being highly educated on this matter, uh, I would think in Nevada it will be a very close race. Uh, President Clinton was the first Democrat to carry it in quite some time uh, as uh, in the last election. I would love to say that that was because of the uh, astute political knowledge of his campaign chairman, <clears throat> except that uh, the fact that Ross Perot carried two counties in Nevada and had a significantly higher percentage of the vote there than others probably played a factor in it. So if it's a two-person or a three-person race, in either case it'll be close. Uh, but I hope and believe that President uh, Clinton will again carry Nevada and the nation. Uh, the other speaker behind me probably disagrees with at least that national assessment. Uh, Four years ago, uh, Bill Clinton got 42 percent of the vote in Wisconsin, and George Bush got 38 percent, and, uh, and uh, uh, Ross Perot got a little over 19 percent. If it's a two-man race in Wisconsin, um, Bob Dole will win. It'll be close, because Wisconsin is, uh, is, uh, leans more to the Democratic side, but I am confident that Bob Dole would carry it in a two-man race. In a three-man race, I think that it would be very difficult for the Republicans to win, depending upon how well Ross Perot does, because I am confident it would take more votes away from the Republicans than the Democrats. But overall, I think that uh, I would hope that Ross Perot would not get in, but uh, I think that it's going to have a tremendous impact on our chances. But I think Bob Dole will be the next president. Governor Thompson. Please discuss Senator Dole's options for a running mate. <laughs> Does it include you? Are you seeking it? Let me answer it this way. I have 25 uh, telephones in the governor's office, and I do not allow all 25 to be used at one time. <laughs> um, I... Um, I think that uh, the best person for Bob Dole would be uh, Colin Powell. It would be uh, the strongest ticket, and I think it uh, would be good for America, it would be good for the Republicans, and it certainly would be helpful to Bob Dole. And I would hope that Colin Powell would accept the nomination if, he, if he's called upon to do so. If not, I would hope that it would be a Republican governor, and there are a whole plethora of strong Republican governors out there. I do not see a, a scenario under which I would be chosen. I would just like to take this opportunity to clarify to the national press that I believe that Al Gore should remain Vice President of the United States, and I will uh, dispel this groundswell of support for selecting myself or some other Democratic governor. But governor Miller, you serve with these governors. If you were Senator Dole, who would you pick as his running mate? Um, Thompson of Wisconsin, uh, Angler of Michigan, uh, Edgar of Illinois. Uh. How tragic that you left out the one woman governor in that category uh, who's often mentioned, Christy Whitman. Uh, I would certainly select Governor Thompson. You can pay me later. <laughs> uh, 
I, I think that uh, Senator Dole would be uh, wise to select any of the governors that you've just listed. Uh, certainly all of them have a great deal of experience. Uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with Governor Thompson, and I think he would be an outstanding vice presidential candidate, uh, uh, but certainly, uh, as he would be the first to say, you know, the other governors that have been mentioned also are very qualified individuals. Uh, governor Thompson, you have been governor for a long time. Since <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it sound like that, I'll tell you. <laughs> Since 1987. Which cabinet position would best suit your interests, skills, um, et cetera, in the event you are not offered the vice presidential slot? I think somebody should be talking to Senator Dole. I think that he's going to have a, a, a lot to say who's going to be in his cabinet and who's going to be his running mate. I, I have no inclination whatsoever to, uh, to be in Senator Dole's, uh, President Dole's uh, soon-to-be cabinet. I am very happy being governor. I enjoy it. I think a governor can accomplish so much. And if you really look across America right now, you will find that the ideas, the changes, the directions are done by governors, Democrats and Republicans alike. They're the ones that are driving the changes in policy and education and welfare and Medicaid and Medicare. And I happen to be one of those individuals that am pleased and delighted to be able to be a governor at this time. And uh, I think a governor has a lot more to accomplish and can do so much more than somebody in the cabinet. So I would uh, hasten to add that uh, I think that if President Dole uh, uh, wants uh, some people, there's a lot of people out there, but I do not think too many Republican governors will be looking for cabinet positions. I'm not. I think President Clinton, during his second term, uh, if he desired to pick a Republican member of his cabinet, Governor Thompson would certainly be qualified. <laughs> If Americans are saying that education is the number one issue, how can you say that newspapers and pundits and others are not talking about it? Well, basically, they are talking about it, uh, but not as much as they should be. And when, you, when the uh, political pundits and the educational press are talking about it, it's usually relegated to the fifth or sixth page, the second part of the newspaper. And uh, I think it should be more prominently mentioned on the front page, and uh, you have a much, much better opportunity to, uh, to be uh, exhibited across the, our airwaves and TV and press than it currently is getting. But the real thing that's driving education as the dominant issue is not the political pundits, nor, uh, nor the press. And it's parents, it's individuals that do not see uh, that their children are getting the proper education. It's business leaders across America that see graduates that are coming to their place of business that can't read or write or compute. It's governors like Bob Miller who, and his wife Sandy, who is a school teacher, and, and uh, myself, who also has a wife as a school teacher, that are really trying to improve the quality of education. So I really believe it's more the governors and uh, parents and people across America that are bringing education to the forefront because they do not see that the education quality is improving as much as it should in our, in our local schools. I, I would only add that I think that journalism as a whole uh, oftentimes disproportionately focuses on the negative as opposed to the positive. I know I had a disheartening experience late last year when my wife and I uh, called uh, the press together to go do on tours of educational excellence uh, in the state of Nevada, and we, we got much less of a response than we do when you're just debating issues of high controversy. Uh, I would hope that one of the outcomes herein is to focus on the things that we're doing right and sharing those, and each state and district benefiting from each other. And certainly, if it's the first in the minds of the public, I would hope it would be on the front page every day as to what's going on in education and what strides we are and should be making in the future. Uh, both of you, what do you think of the Senate's 84 to 16 vote to restore education funds cut by the Republican-dominated House? Yay. <laughs> I think it's the right thing. I think it's... Uh, it needs to be done, but I would hasten to add that the education funding in America, even though, as uh, Governor Miller has indicated, it's important, it really doesn't impact 
totally that much because it is only six or seven percent of the total education. But I'm glad they restored it. I think it's the right decision, and I'm happy they did. Will public education atrophy or disappear if we pass tax laws and other incentives such as vouchers for private education? I, I don't think so. I, I think competition is good. And uh, you're still uh, not going to be able to uh, take over public education with vouchers or with public school choice or with private school non-sectarian uh, schools. The uh, truth of the matter is, is I think competition is good. We've started a voucher program in Wisconsin in just the largest school district, Milwaukee. But it's a very small program compared to public education. And uh, I happen to believe that public education is going to continue to educate the dominant the majority of our students, should be, and will continue to do so. But I do not see anything wrong with trying a whole lot of different kinds of uh, changes to improve education. For instance, in Milwaukee, uh, uh, they have, it's a large urban school district like other ones. It's improving, but the private uh, school choice is working out well. It allows for some competition, allows for some parental choice, and I think that's good. I certainly believe that there's room in this country for both private and public education, but that we must take care to ensure that uh, it is not an imbalance uh, based upon social or economic considerations. Uh, I think that the majority of our students in this country go to public schools, uh, and it's, it's a good thing. And we should make sure that we retain that balance and not uh, restructure our educational structure so that those that are economically disadvantaged are relegated to uh, less quality education. Uh, certainly that's our goal in the Educational Summit is to address public education. But on the other hand, who will represent concerns and interests of the private educational sector at the summit? We do have representation from private uh, educational uh, systems, uh, as we do uh, many of the other elements uh, of the education system. They will be physically present. We certainly welcome the input. I think that there's a, a distinct relationship that should be retained. And as long as we keep the appropriate balance, uh, I think that uh, that's best for all the students in our country. What we, what we did is we set up a, a way to bring in all the different kinds of views on education at the summit. Each governor gets to bring one of the CEOs from his or her respective state. And then we're inviting about 35 other educational experts, from teachers' union to private uh, representations from colleges and uh, public schools, teachers, school board members, uh, individual uh, heads of uh, certain business organization, educational groups like the school boards and the PTO, uh, PTA. All of these things are, are organizations to allow for a real good discourse on education and trying to find out ways to have people uh, come together at the summit and be able to give their views in a, in a dynamic manner. And uh, there's going to be some, some uh, controversy, and I think that's good. And uh, we do not want to shut out anybody. And we're also going to allow for, uh, C-SPAN is going to cover it, we're also going to allow for individuals in respective states to, to watch and observe and call in with their questions as to how they think we should be doing as far as standards and assessments. We're going to have a panel of experts to answer their questions. So I think it's really going to be a, a real dynamic summit, and uh, anybody that wants to listen in or call in, we'd appreciate that, and thank you. And, and the listeners at home, I hope that they will do so as well uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday. If children are motivated, they can learn under just about any educational system, uh, homeschooling, um, one-room schoolhouses, or classrooms of 40. Will education reform ever work when social problems are overwhelming the lives of young Americans? It has to. I mean, if, if you don't, you're admitting to defeat and the, and the demise of, uh, of your modern uh, school system and, uh, and your truly uh, your quality of life in your country. I absolutely think that education is the way to do that. And I absolutely believe that uh, we have the greatest opportunity as governors committed to improving the quality of education to accomplish that. Uh, educators have a very difficult uh, time these days with all the social problems that come into the classroom. But education is the way to improve those social problems and social concerns. And that's why the governors and business leaders across America are coming together 
committed to try and improve the educational standards. I would like to point out that Milwaukee Public School is a large urban school district, and they took it upon themselves, and they have all the social problems that any large school district across America has. And they decided that they were going to require a math examination before you could be promoted to the next class or to graduate. And the first year, the, the students didn't do so, so well. But the second year, they improved considerably. And it's a very tough, te tough test, and the standards are very high. And I compliment Milwaukee for, for raising that bar a little bit higher. And they're doing that, and I think that's what's needed in America and for education, to raise that bar, because every child can learn, and every child should have the opportunity to learn and give them the best education possible. By raising the bar, we think we can improve the quality of education and at the same time solve a lot of social problems affecting children and families across America. I think that our students can do better and we have expected too little of them. We've set standards too low. Uh, they need to be raised. But certainly we should not ignore, uh, especially when we're talking about accountability, the reality that there is a grave discrepancy between some, one school and another in various parts of this country. Uh, and that should be taken into account as far as additional resources, teacher training, and assistance, at least initially, to try and bring all schools up to parity because it's one thing to go to a school and worry about whether your computer is working that day or whether you have the highest technology. It's another thing to go to a school and worry, as some students do, whether the roof's going to fall on your head, you're going to be uh, robbed or mugged during the school day. So we have to make an effort to make sure that each school provides the best opportunity to learn for each student. You mentioned those roofs. We read of schools with leaking roofs, broken windows, and broken toilets. These are mostly in poor communities. How can a rich country allow this to happen? Do you believe there should be a federal investment and guarantee in such situations? The federal government does play a role in trying to provide quality education uh, for economically disadvantaged, and that's what I outlined earlier in my prepared remarks. Uh, that should continue. The enhancement thereof, I think, is important, and I commend uh, the Clinton administration, for example, for trying to increase uh, that funding in future budgets. Uh, and I believe that, that we all need to work together, but certainly state and local funding plays a more distinct and proportionate role in that very problem. And what we need to do is just make sure that we try and bring everybody up to par in their ability to learn and their opportunity to learn. Uh, I think once we've done that, then you can get into a strict competition. But at least initially, there should be a measurement of improvement against oneself, recognizing that uh, suburban school districts and urban are not necessarily going to be on par in the initial assessments. Uh, try and improve and measure it against themselves. If they're not proving, improving against themselves, then immediate steps should be taken to rectify that, uh, whether they're financial assistance, uh, additional teacher learning, or even some restrictions or ramifications by state involvement. Do you want to say something? Well, yeah, yes I did, because uh, there's no way the federal government is going to ever be able to finance education. Uh, they're right now putting in 6 to 7 percent, some places even all the way up to 8 percent. But this education is a local issue. It's a state issue. And states all across America are putting in a tremendous amount of money into education. In fact, we spend more per capita on education in the United States than any other country in the world, without a doubt. And so you have to really not only have the standards, but you have to make an assessment. Just throwing money at a problem has never solved it. You have to have an assessment to find out how well we're doing with that investment of money. Are the children learning? Are they improving? Are we investing the money in the right place? And that's why it's so critical to be able to have the standards, but even more importantly, the assessments. Because the assessments are going to be able to compare the ABC school district with the DEF and the XYZ. And that is going to drive, I think, more than anything else from a poor to a a rich school district to find out 
because you can find some poor school districts that excel a lot more than some school districts that pay more money. And we have made a, a very concerted effort to look at that in Wisconsin as well as in other places. It's just not money that's going to improve education. And that's why the assessment portion, and that's why this conference is so important, the assessment is going to be able to give us a better idea how well we invest our money, how well our students are, are doing, what they're learning, and how much they're learning. And that, to me, is going to drive competition between states. It's going to drive competition between school districts. And you will find that that will help to raise that bar and make all of education stronger and better in America. How can all the standards and assessments raise the education level if principals are afraid to allow their teachers to grade students too harshly? Isn't there an ingrained mediocrity built into public education? I certainly hope not, and I don't believe that's true. And I, I don't know of any principals that uh, are, are reprimanding school teachers for grading too harshly. It may happen. You can find, I'm sure, anecdotal evidence, evidence that that may be true. But I would say the vast majority of principals and superintendents and school teachers in America, the vast majority, and I want to underscore that, are doing a very good job under some very difficult circumstances. But it would be helpful if we would know by the standards and assessments how well they're doing and where we might be able to help them do better. And that's why this is so important. People say, why don't you, why don't you expand the, the summit to uh, take up choice and merit pay and, and uh, discharges and so on and so forth. And I really believe that the, the crucial part of really trying to improve education in America is to set some standards high, make the assessments so we know how well we're doing, and that will drive all these other issues. It will drive the testing, it will drive the, the teachers to do a better job, the principals, and so on. But I would like to hearken back to what I originally said. I think the educators are doing as good a job right now as we have expected of them. I think we need to raise that standard and expect more of, of uh, our teachers and superintendents and, and principals as well as our students. I'm going to answer that one, or you're going to ask the next one, and I'll just stand here. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, that certainly we ought to, <laughs> to, you didn't act fast enough, so I preempted. <laughs> certainly, uh, we need to recognize that there's modifications that need, need to be made in the entire structure. And there's many innovative ideas that are coming in various states throughout the country that each of us should share from. Uh, in Oregon, for example, it's my understanding that they're trying to measure a student's uh, accomplishments uh, based upon actual testing as opposed to their age grade scenario that most of us hear. And that's, I think, puts age and grade similarities, put pressure on principals and teachers to uh, pass the student on to the next grade just because they're of the appropriate age. So we need to look at all of those types of programs and compare them and see what works best. And we've evolved from a one-room schoolhouse into the educational structure we have now. Maybe it's time to refocus on just what does work best and, and look at those type of ideas. Apple founder Steve Jobs, one of Silicon Valley's um, most successful dropouts, said uh, recently he concluded that technology will never change education. The only hope, said Jobs, is to destroy the teachers' unions. Will Jobs be asked to address the education summit? Uh, no, but the, uh, the current uh, head of uh, Apple is, uh, is going to uh, be in attendance. Um, it's, you know, there, there are problems in education. That's why we're having the summit. I take a position that, uh, that we, we need to address some of the union issues. But I think that would be very divisive at this summit. And that's why we're limiting uh, our discussion to standards and to assessment and to technology. I think if you set the standards and assessment and expect more of the student, expect more of the teacher and the school district and have a, a valid assessment, you're going to be able to drive the improvements in teaching and students and uh, equality. And that's why we're doing it. Um, I don't think it's going to help, uh, you know, to spend our time bashing one group over the other group. 
I think what we have to do is start working together overall, collectively, and cooperatively in America on a bipartisan basis like uh, Bob Miller and, and myself are doing in the National Governors Organization and the Education Commission of the States. I think America is thirsting for bipartisanship right now. They're thirsting for a degree of cooperation, a degree of unity, and I think it's an education that we can all come together at this summit and work together to try and find ways to improve the quality of education and find some answers. That's what we're going to do next Tuesday and Wednesday, and I think that's a much better way than picking on one group or another and saying they're the cause of it. Because all of us are the cause of the failure of education, and we can all be part of the solution. And that's what I hope that we'll be able to accomplish next week. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give both of you uh, certificates of appreciation for coming here today. Thank you. And um, for when things might get a little dull at the summit, here's a coffee mug for each of you. Thank you so very much, Sloan. Now I have a very serious question. Has anybody yet asked you if, with this traveling roadshow on education, that you are Mud and Jeff? <laughs> You answer that do, do we get to pick which one we are? <laughs> and I kind of like to pick a different cartoon character, maybe you know, like the Superman, because he gets Lois Lane. <laughs> what do you have to say, Mutt? <laughs> I would like to just to uh, respond, even though uh, Nevada is uh, a very wealthy state, I would like to present to the press club uh, with uh, a plate from Wisconsin to uh, acknowledge that we were here to thank you for your hospitality, all of you. It's been a great audience, and uh, thank you so very much. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> thank you. Next, no, we, we don't, don't ordinarily get gifts, so, so that's very, very nice, but maybe, um, maybe something from Las Vegas. We're, we're going to send you the, the recipe on how to win on slot machines. So we in the, it's in the mail. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, Nancy Shia, Federal News Service, Robert Vitale, Thompson Newspapers, Annette Lecitra, Executive Editor, Education Daily, Keith White, Gannett News Service, Frank Okafer, Washington Bureau Chief, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and past president of the National Press Club. I'm going to skip over one of our speakers for a moment. Peggy Roberson, freelance journalist and chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. And then I'll skip over our other speaker. Tommy Batt, Las Vegas, I'm sorry, Tony Batt, Las Vegas Review Journal. Kevin Keene, communications director for Governor Thompson. William Salisbury, St. Paul Pioneer Press. Peter West, Education Week. And Lewis Perlman, executive editor, Knowledge, Inc. In 1989, at the request of then President George Bush, the nation's governors gathered at the first National Education Summit. They set six goals. My name is Sonia Hilgren. I am president of the Press Club and editor of Farm Journal. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN, listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Network. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. Tomorrow, Rene Preval, the president of Haiti, will present a speech entitled Haiti, Democracy and Investment. On Wednesday, March 27th, Tom Downs, the president and chairman of the board of Amtrak, will talk about the future of Amtrak, focusing on high-speed rail on the eastern seaboard and rail safety. 
And on Thursday, April 4th, economist Lester Thoreau will address a press club audience. Transcripts and audio and videotapes of press club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334. If you have any questions for our speakers, please write them on the cards at your table, send them up to me, and I will ask as many as time permits. Goals later expanded to eight for improving public elementary and secondary education. Almost seven years later, another summit is planned next week, March 26th and 27th. The National Governors Association says that at most, only modest progress has been made in achieving the 1989 goals, and in some areas, students' performance has actually declined. A recent Gallup poll found that education, for the first time, was the number one issue of concern for Americans ahead of crime, health care, welfare, and jobs. Here today to discuss the upcoming Education Summit are this year's chairman of the National Governors Association, Republican Governor Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin, and the vice president of the NGA, Democratic Governor Bob Miller of Nevada. Our first speaker today, Wisconsin Governor Tommy Thompson, is perhaps best known for his campaign to reform Wisconsin's welfare system. Governor Thompson has also stressed education. He has advocated, for example, statewide examinations that would allow comparisons among schools and school districts, special aid to schools that are particularly effective in educating their students, and school choice, state subsidy to attorneys association, and was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to the National Task Force on Victims' Assistance. We look forward to what our speakers have to tell us today about the upcoming National Education Summit, First, give a National Press Club welcome to Governor Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you for inviting myself and uh, Governor, Governor Bob Miller from Nevada to meet with you here today and to discuss uh, what I think is probably the most important subject facing America today. We're going to be discussing education at the Education Summit next week, and I believe it's going to serve as two watershed days for the future of education in our respective states. This summer, our athletes will once again compete against the world's best in the Centennial Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. Imagine for a moment what our country's reaction would be if America and its athletes finished 14th in the medal count in Atlanta. There would be banner headlines in every one of your newspapers. ...is to help parents pay tuition for their children at private schools. Before becoming governor, Tommy Thompson spent 20 years in the Wisconsin State Assembly, the last five as leader of, for the GOP minority. He earned the nickname Dr. No for his efforts to contain state spending. Our second speaker today, Democratic Governor Bob Miller of Nevada, has also pushed education reform since he was first elected governor in 1990. Governor Miller has stressed the need to improve the quality of education, even as the state struggled to provide enough classrooms as Nevada's population grew exponentially in recent years. He has pushed for smaller elementary school classes and the use of educational technology. Before being elected governor, Governor Miller was first lieutenant governor and then later served as acting governor for two years after Governor Richard Bryan was elected to the U.S. Senate. Governor Miller has been active in efforts to aid victims of crimes, an interest growing out of his earlier career as a deputy sheriff, deputy district attorney, and then two-term district attorney in Las Vegas, a sensitive position in that mecca for gamblers. He has served as president of the National District